Um, so it is April 20th, 2023. Um, today we have uh, the two Going With The Flow artists from the site Santa Fe show that opened this last weekend here in New Mexico. Um, Baja has been working around <laughs> water issues and uh, the Rio Grande did a project for a multi-year project uh, for several years back in starting in the, the 90s. Um, and she'll be sharing about her projects, the repositories and ice books, and Paula, who's also a, a homegrown New Mexican. Um, she's down in Belen. Is that is that how you said pronounced it? Belen. 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 Yeah. Belen. Belen. Um, which is yeah, home of uh, Judy Chicago's flower <laughs> store and all that. You know, but um, yeah, other things, priorities. The Rio Grande flows through uh, that town. And that's where you grew up, right, Paula? That's right, before Judy Chicago arrived. Before Judy <laughs> Chicago, exactly. <laughs> before the flower showed up, the flower store. Before the flowers yeah. and all the pictures. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I think we talked about Paula going first and then Baja, and um, they're each going to share their screen and talk about their work in going with the flow. And um, and then after that, we'll we'll do a little uh, show and tell with Baja's new book, Repositories. And if any of you are wanting to buy a book, this would be a good day to do that. Baja can sign a book for you. And um, so we'll just get going and I'll uh, unpin myself and Baja and we'll give you the floor, Paula. Thank you so much. Uh, my name again is Paula Castillo. And as Trisha said, I'm a native New Mexican. I'm a local, um, which kind of means I'm I'm a mestiza with indigenous and European roots whose family has long lived in the rural parts of this particular area of the North American Southwest. I really do have deep and intimate feelings for all New Mexican human geography. As an artist, I create sculptural and performative installations um, that explore the intersections between the cultural and physical landscapes to reveal the critical interrelationships between humans, the home places we colonize and the environment. My work could be categorized as um, allegorical narratives um, that imagine the immense complexity involved in the deep abiding oneness for all entities from humans to water, rocks, insects, etc. The all-encompassing goal for my work is to expose our real, dense, and buried attachment to all others. I'd like to thank Trisha Watts for inviting me to speak today. I am in awe, Trisha, of your tireless effort and singular vision for art's potential to reveal solutions to humans' wildly excessive pride. And I'm so, so honored to be presenting today with the delightful and hardcore Basha Erland, whose work with Western Waters should be required study in all ecology and arts education programming. Um, so I'm going to share two projects today. And I'll start. I'm going to do a share screen. Let's see. The first is called Reverse the Curse. Um, and it imagines the river beyond a human resource as a subject deserving of rights. This participatory project captures a democratic rendering of a local curandera derived remedia to undo a mal de ojo curse on the Rio Grande. It uses kind of what I call the audacity of local magic and traditional healing practices to provide an allegory for an embodied tithing to the Rio Grande River, an entitlement that is not allowed uh, to a body of water that is not allowed to have any share of the water she carries. The second project I'll talk about briefly is called About Jetty Jack, and it reflects on unjust environmental conditions produced and sustained through engineering practices. I'd like to begin by sharing a little bit of my background with the Rio Grande River. These two pictures seen here are pictures taken by my dad, um, the one on the left is my mom carrying me, getting into the car before mass. I was um, uh, born and raised in a, 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 a county in the middle of the state of New Mexico in the southwestern region of the American Southwest. Um, so Valencia County is in the middle of the state. It's considered to be the heart of the middle Rio Grande Valley. 
I grew up in a little cinder block home that you see here about 100 feet from the railroad tracks running through Belen. My dad built our family home on this property because it was cheap land and he believed that being on the west side of the burned track, you can kind of see it there. I'm riding my bike on the right one and you can see the train and the burned track probably popping up from that landscape about four feet. So he believed that um, that berm would protect us from the Rio Grande flooding. And indeed, since the early 20th century, the railroad berm had protected homes many times on, the, on this side of the river. When I was a kid growing up in Belen in the 1960s, no one went to the river. Basha hadn't come down yet. <laughs> the river was like a closed off fortress, a prisoner of the middle Rio Grande Conservancy District, which managed and allotted the river. It was already just an irrigation canal. To me, it was like um, the DMZ zone, heavily managed space. My first experience with, with the river was as ironic as it gets and occurred when I was a teenager. I got a job across the river from my house at a newly built country club. There was never anything like this anywhere in the history of my rural community, and it has since been abandoned. But in the early 70s, a developer purchased thousands of acres of shrubland at the bottom of the Manzano Mountains, which is at the tail end, the, the ancient tail end of the Sangre de Cristos. And he sold it off sight unseen in many instances to about 500 new families, most who relocated to our community from the urban regions of the North American East Coast Replete with a heavily watered golf course, the country club boasted a 50-yard pool where I, where I worked as a lifeguard. Um, this is me just recently at the river, and it reminds me of my first experiences with the river. So for this job, every day I would walk or ride my bike to and from work crossing the river bridge, and here was my first intimate experience with her. It really was spectral. I'd stop for long periods of time staring in wonder at every one of her corners as much as possible, meditating on the cottonwood canopy and New Mexico olive and willow understory overgrown with salt cedar, counting the hundreds of jetty jacks placed along her banks in the 1960s to keep her meander straight, listening to the sweet whistles, the echoey whistles of the middle lark, while watching her slow velvet movement over sandbars, feeling the coolness of this riparian environment entertaining an insect in my mouth. This experience with her levitating above her, I think changed my life. In the 1970s, by the 1970s, the river was no longer flooding like it had in the early to mid 20th century. In 1912, 1920, 1929, 1941, and the last time was 1968. There are hundreds of documents, hundreds, I'm sorry, hundreds of documented and undocumented stories of the human causation of this early 20th century flooding. But the most tragic and epic is how the building of that train line in front of my childhood home was a major contributor to that flooding. When the Atchison, Topeka and Santa Fe Railroad Company decided that the best way to compete with the opening of the Panama Canal shipping prices was to lay tracks through my hometown of Belen into California they searched and searched for a source of Douglas fir that could supply all the ties. They found that source in the forests of the Santa Barbara land grant northeast of Simayo, New Mexico, in the forests surrounding Hikarita Peak, and the Santa Barbara Tie and Pole Company was born. They bought 300,000 300, acres of the grant for 25 cents an acre, which not long before had been spuriously separated from the larger Spanish land grant through the strange business of the US Court of Private Land Claims. And of course, which not long before that, had been cleaved from the Hikaria Apache by the Spanish crown, who spuriously assumed their authority over it. For 17 years, until there were no more trees to cut, the lumberjacks voraciously cut down every tree in sight that would make ties. Sawmills were temporarily installed at elevations up to 11,000 feet so the company could produce the ties on site. They even set up track in the denuded forest to carry the ties to the, to the Rio Santa Barbara at Peñasco where they sat and waited until the spring when the river, swollen with snowmelt, could carry the ties rushing headlong by the hundreds of thousands 
through the narrow canyons until the river converged with the Rio Grande at Embudo. The transport of ties was made easier ironically because of the clear cutting involved. The trees were no longer there to shade and protect the winter snowpack and now the snowpack melted quickly under the spring sun and bloated the rivers. In one degree of separation, the cut trees triggered their own funeral transport on the way to their burial spots where even in their death they worked holding up miles and miles of steel railroad track. The forest spilled its guts for those ties and all that mud and thickness ended up downstream near places like Isleta, Los Lunas, and Belen where I grew up. The river became clogged with the mountain soil and made the Rio Grande rise, causing thousands of acres of productive fields to become waterlogged and nearly infertile and unleashed that torrential flooding in the early 20th century. Worse yet, this fallout of human chauvinism and colossal oversight let loose a multitude of forest mechanistic applications on the river to purge it of its supposed natural wastefulness and excessive movements. Over the last 150 years, the Rio Grande has become a colonized migrant. Appallingly, in mid 20th century engineering reports, it is the river who is blamed. She has been called wasteful, and superfluous, unnecessary. And now fast forward to the 21st century, the river has surrendered legally every drop of her water to a procession of governing bodies even before it falls as rain or snow from the sky. Shouldn't she be entitled to some of the water she carries? This concern is the harbinger for my project, Reverse the Curse. Imagine that the true original cause of the Rio Grande suffering was a mal de ojo or evil eye curse incited by the American myth of boundless resources. The river, after all, like most victims of the mal de ojo, is a precious life source. It makes sense that the river's natural good fortune provoked the mal de ojo attack by settlers who wanted what she had. Since 2021, I've rallied concerned citizens living along the Rio Grande to come together to perform a curandera-derived remedia and common mal de ojo reversal. Um, as a side note, uh, curanderisma um, is a, a liminal practice um, that leverages both hegemonic structure, European structure like the Catholic Church that the Spanish brought over, uh, while utilizing um, the deep-rooted healing traditions of native healing practices, communal healing, healing practices. And so their, their role in a community is to provide remedias to help hu typically humans heal. And in this case, I, I think, why not? You know, it, the river is a sentient being after all. This remedia for me reveals a grassroots desire for participatory guardianship to this vital oasis that has made so many of these communities along the Rio Grande possible. So I invited folks from Taos, New Mexico, down to Juarez, Mexico, to perform this remedia for the Rio Grande at their local river bridge. As well, these events provide as allegory, a tithing back to the river, a water entitlement to a body of water that has given everything of herself to our human communities, but not allowed to have any of the water she carries. These performances have been documented with still images by portrait photographer Don Usner. And the images, this one and the four previous one, are stills from some of our events. I'm going to do one other thing now. Give me one moment. So for going with the flow, the show at Site Santa Fe, I took several of these stills and used them as a springboard for inventive cinemagraphs to offer another audience a space to experience a re-performance of this healing ritual while challenging art conventions by acknowledging the Rio Grande River and its ecological processes as both participant and audience. This, is, this piece is called uh, Annie Hana Smoke Medicine. Annie is an incredible um, local um, but universal activist who practices in our region and has done incredible uh, work um, 
tireless without any any um, attention to issues dealing with our larger environment, but particularly the Rio Grande. Uh, this one is of a little student of mine down here in Belen. Um, it's called Diana de Belen, Tithing to the River. And I, I wanted to, I think that some of this, the, our awareness now is so harrowing. I, just, I don't know even how to handle it sometimes. And I do, I teach young children. I work with young children who are so precious and hopeful. And I wanted to create um, something that, that was a little bit more accessible to a younger person. And um, Deanna and her family really enjoyed being at the river and looking down into it again and sort of recreating my, my imaginings of it when I was a young teenager. This one is called Lily and Friends Tithing to the Rio Grande. Um, some of you may know uh, Lily Lawrence. She's um, a high school junior here in New Mexico. Her mother is Laura Pascas, who's uh, an ecological queen in our region. And I wanted to do something soft and evocative and mysterious and haunting with this one. And then this last one, this is called Miguel Tithing to the River. Um, Miguel Hoffman, shown here, is um, a, an, an arborist who, who practices saving all kinds of trees, even trees that shouldn't be here in New Mexico anymore. And I, I'm really taken with his ethic of honoring all life. And so, But I wanted to create something that was slightly humorous. This is actually um, in Española, for those of you who know, who enter, who, sorry, those of you who know the state of New Mexico, this is up north. Um, and I wanted to show like, you know, Miguel really giving some water to the river. My goal for the overall project was to contribute to an inclusive and diverse engagement essential to creating a robust civic and social dialogue about the river's right to good health and the larger conversation about the middle Rio Grande's long-term water security. So uh, this is, it's a sculpture called About Jetty Jack, and it's made from steel angle iron and plexiglass with a printed transparent film of an event image from the participatory Reverse the Curse. And it's an approximation of a Kellner jetty, which is a civil engineering construction designed by a civil engineer uh, from Oklahoma. And it was produced and erected throughout the middle Rio Grande corridor. Thousands of them were placed along the middle, the Rio Grande in the mid 20th century to straighten the banks of the river. Um, this is, these are, these are actual jetty jacks and they are, there are literally thousands of them along the river banks. It was a very successful system for controlling the meander. So it was no surprise when someone got the idea to use jetties to straighten out the entire middle Rio Grande Valley. This engineering feat produced unintended consequences, though, as we know, like interrupting the river's natural processes, disturbing habitats of species now extirpated or endangered, and promoting exotic species at the expense of native vegetation. When it was done, the river was no longer a natural stream, but a highly modified water storage mm -hmm. and conveyance system with extensive flood control structures. And this is the river that I grew up with. So the, the sculpture that I placed in front of site um, attempts to juxtapose curanderisma, which is a holistic healing system with mid 20th century engineering practices, both sort of with the same goals to improve life for humans, <laughs> to critically examine the impact though of mechanical applications on the Rio Grande River's health. As an engineering simulcra, it leverages the Kellner Jack as an enduring record of these mechanical practices and raises questions about the complicated relationship between engineering and environmental justice for the river. Ultimately, my hope with this piece is that it helps us reflect on how unjust environmental conditions are often produced and sustained by short-sighted engineering practices and how that might be made otherwise. Thank you all very much. 
I'm going to stop sharing now, Trisha. Okay. Let's see. Yeah, I'm unmuted. Yay. <laughs> yeah, the Jenny Jack sculpture, we were, we were out front. I did a little live. Um, I didn't record it, but uh, on Instagram, I, I wasn't paying attention because I was recording. And uh, I just put a link I found online if someone wants to learn more about Jenny Jacks. But I ha I'd never heard anything about that before until I saw your sculpture. 